Ok. Twenty seventeen was a perfect example of how bad gaming can get. I can't believe that all these devs release such atrocities they call games onto the world. Gaming is gonna die at this rate. Said absolutely no one ever. Okay, now let's get serious. Aside from a few bumps, I believe everyone can agree that 2017 was an amazing year for video games. Many great games from various talented companies, both big named and indie alike, came out, giving everyone experiences that they will reflect on in following years. I meant in a positive way. 2017 alone granted me a PS4 and a Nintendo Switch just for some games that came out during that time frame. And even then, I couldn't get around to nearly as much as I wanted because of the non-stop release of new titles. Let that speak volumes for how good of a gaming year this was. But likewise with other years, there are games that I played last year that I liked more than others. Much like Simulus I did previously, this list is not restricted to games that came out in 2017. If I played it for the first time last year, it counts. And aside from the usual countdown rules, nothing else applies. So let me show you what games made my 2017 an excellent year. One of the many reasons as to why 2017 was a great year for gaming was the fact that various indie studios put their best foot forward. We got a lot of great indie titles that really had their own styles in terms of visuals and gameplay that really caught the attention of many people. Which brings me to number 10 on this list, the biggest hit among all these new indie games, Cuphead. From the moment this game was first revealed at Microsoft's E3 2014 conference, I thought that this game would be a visual wonder with plenty of fun to go along with it. And in a lot of ways, I was right. This game is graphically stunning, replicating various cartoons from the 1930s era, but doing so in a way that doesn't make the game look or feel outdated. There's so much personality and life put into every little detail, and there's always something new to see that the game never gets visually boring, even during some bosses that I don't think too fondly of. The same thing applies to the gameplay too. Even though Cuphead takes inspiration from a lot of old school shooters, it's able to hold its own in terms of quality compared to modern games and does not feel outdated or hard for all the wrong reasons. But don't take that as the game being easy, because it's not. It's actually really hard, but in a way that feels fair and doesn't make you feel the amount of anger that YouTubers who tried playing Getting Over It felt. It's hard in a way that doesn't anger you, but instead makes you understand your skill level so that you can eventually come up with a strategy to beat a level or a boss. Reinforced by the fact that levels and bosses rarely go over two and a half minutes, and the fact that if you do die, you get to see how far you progressed. When you see how close you were to reaching another phase, or how you were SO CLOSE to finishing the task at hand, it gives you confidence to try again and finally triumph in the end. Speaking of all that, the traditional side-scrolling levels in Cuphead, while heavily undermined by the numerous amount of bosses in the game, are still fun in their own way, throwing in obstacles to test your reflexes and platforming abilities, and changing the overall gimmick to fit the environment. And each boss really requires that you pay attention to see what's going on and bring your A-game to see how they work so you can find a way to beat them. Granted, there are a few bosses that completely blow, but no ride is a smooth one all the way through. Really, there's not much else I can say about this game. Cuphead is visually stunning and has plenty of joyful, if very difficult times to be had, and is overall a really fun and well-crafted game that gives the indie game industry a good name. And bear this in mind, this was actually a studio's first game. Man, it is absolutely amazing how a small team could turn out a project this amazing and have it end up winning so many awards. Studio MDHR, you really worked hard on this game in the five years of development you had, and your hard work has definitely paid off. Ubisoft! What can I say about them? They've created some pretty fantastic titles from time to time, but they've also created examples of bad business practices affecting the industry, and seen as rather worn out given how much they pump out Assassin's Creed games. However, when Ubisoft makes something amazing, they really knock it out of the park, like say... Rayman Legends for example. Prior to this game, I have never actually played a Rayman game, but after playing this, I just may need to because there are so many credible things about this game that proves that Ubisoft has talent. From the gorgeous art style that brings out the life in everything, to the fantastic level design that opens up many pathways, to the music levels that are some of the best ideas for levels put into any game, to the near-perfect controls, to the beautiful soundtrack, Rayman Legends is an absolute spectacle from start to finish. And hey, even though the main campaign alone warrants the purchase of the game itself, that is not all this game has to offer. Rayman Legends has a soccer mode that is actually a decent amount of fun, especially when playing with a buddy, daily and weekly challenges that really put your skills to the test and reward you with more collectibles, and even the levels from Rayman Origins are here as bonus content. So in a way, purchasing Rayman Legends means you're getting a new adventure and Rayman Origins all in one package. That's a good deal. 
No matter what version you decide to get, or what price you decide to pay, you're getting yourself a masterpiece of a 2D platformer that has all the levels from another fantastic 2D platformer, leading to the overall product having heaps of replay value. Believe me, with all the game has going for it, it's definitely worth getting. Well, it's about time I picked these games up! I've become a huge fan of Platinum Games ever since I first played Metal Gear Rising back in 2013, but it took me until the beginning of 2017 to give the Bayonetta games a whirl. The first Bayonetta game is a fantastically made hack and slash with a slick combat system and amazing bosses, but it was held back by some annoyances like quick time events and a couple of annoying set pieces. And the second game? Well, that one is many levels of YES! Nearly every issue I had with Bayonetta 1 was ironed out in the sequel, but Bayonetta 2 goes the extra distance to make itself one of the best games I have ever played on the Wii U. The combat system is a lot more free-flowing than before thanks to the addition of more weapons and the Umbra Climax mechanic. I didn't think it would be possible to make the combat system of the first game better, but this sequel sure as heck proved me wrong on that. With great combat comes absolutely terrific bosses. They embrace everything great about the game and deliver some fast, frantic, and frankly climactic battles, even in the opening chapter! The levels also make their set pieces and design even more fun to travel on than the first because they reward your curiosity more often and have less irritating points. The story also has a lot more stakes involved, and it keeps itself more focused than before, leading to a narrative that is much easier to understand. And in terms of graphics and soundtrack, well, the game advances those two elements as well. So in the end, Beta 2 is an absolutely masterful hack and slash with some great levels, phenomenal bosses, and great replay value. I'm really happy that both Bayonetta games are getting Switch ports very soon. More people need to play this work of art. It's by far a wonderful game, and I hope Bayonetta 3 continues this trend of quality. So about something I said in my Games I Played in 2016 video, I'm just hoping that Sonic Mania and Sonic Forces will get Sonic's track record back up. Well, to an extent, they did. In my opinion, Sonic had a great run this year with both Sonic Mania and Sonic Forces. While both have their strong points, and as much as I want to talk about both of them, I really don't want to create any ties for this countdown. And besides, Sonic Mania is easily the better of the two. While I really like the Genesis-styled Sonic games, I've never actually considered them to be incredible. But Mania? Ho 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 ho! That's another story! Mania takes everything great about the Genesis Sonic games and makes an absolute treat of a game that the series truly deserves. While yes, most levels are recycled from past Sonic titles, they were heavily remade and expanded to give veteran players a new experience. The developers added in new gimmicks to all the old zones that really take advantage of what Sonic is capable of, and the new zones are so much fun and really show the creative ideas the franchise can get. Believe it or not, there's barely a level or a moment that I actually dislike playing through. Most Sonic games have that one level that many people dread having to play, myself included, but Mania is completely consistent and contains joy rides of levels and bosses from start to finish. Oh yes, Sonic Mania also managed to have a great selection of bosses. Compared to the Genesis games which had weak bosses, the ones in Mania are a lot less boring, more creative, and more climactic than previously. Oh, and the sprite work is absolutely incredible. With extra frames of animation and more polished colors, Mania looks even livelier and prettier than the Sonic games of old, and heck, even some of Sonic's recent titles. Add on an amazing soundtrack, bonus stages that let you unlock more modes and goodies to the game, and multiple playable characters, and you can see why this is one of my favorite Sonic games. What's even crazier is the fact that this game wasn't made by Sonic Team, but it was actually made by people who worked on fan games at first, but soon enough made their own versions of older Sonic games. It's absolutely crazy to think that such a group of people like this could come together and create an official, original Sonic game, and have it turn out better than what Sonic Team had in store for the Hedgehog. It just goes to show you that Sonic still has plenty of life left within them, and I hope he continues to be part of great games in the future. I can tell you right now, Fire Emblem has been a franchise that has been prevalent on my mind recently. With the franchise starting to bloom thanks to Awakening and Fates being so successful, I've been a lot more enticed as to what the franchise will do next. In 2017, Fire Emblem had three outings, the first of which was Fire Emblem Heroes on mobile, which is a fun little distraction given how much it's updated and expanded. The second is Fire Emblem Echo Shadows of Lentia, which is a really solid game that tries something new and does it well, but is held back by some abysmal app design points and an extreme lack of replay value. And the third is... Basically what happens when you take the franchise and have it go on recess to do whatever it pleases. Even having horses defy logic. Fire Emblem Warriors doesn't seem like the one I choose out of the three that I just listed, but I did because for what it does, the game is absolutely spectacular. While yes, the map design does decide to play it pretty safe in terms of gimmicks, I ultimately don't care that much because of what Warriors games do best, annihilating every living soul in your way. 
Fire Emblem Warriors does this fantastic. While mixing it well with actual elements from the Fire Emblem series, the triangle system makes a difference in seeing how fast certain enemies can go down, and the maps usually have one type of enemy on one side of the map and another type of enemy on the other side, making it easy to strategize and complete your objective. Some elements like the pair-up system have been added to give the combat system an extra push, since it boosts the stats of whatever character you're using, allows you to make surprise follow-up attacks to drop the enemy guards, provides protection when you get hit, and allows you to unleash a stronger super attack. In terms of combat, this game is amazing at it! Every character has their own unique way of fighting, with combos that are a spectacle to see and lead to some unique ways of defeating enemies, which those processes can be amplified by the upgrade system. These let you have even more combos and power, as well as great defensive abilities so that you won't be defeated as easily. While the story mode is overall fine, if rather linear and predictable, the history mode more than makes up for its shortcomings, so I will refrain from dwelling on it. The challenges in history mode test what you know about the game by constantly changing the scenario and adding new restrictions. This is also the best way to get the most out of every character on the roster. While well, on that note, the roster being as vanilla as some claim isn't an issue for me at least, because every character is an absolute joy to play as and has their uses in some way, with some conveniences exclusive to them, or because their attacks are so much fun to pull off and make quick work out of everything. In other Warriors games, there's typically about one or two characters that I don't care about. That's not the case here. Every character is an absolute blast to play as, especially Takumi, Camilla, Lissa, and many others. Oh, and guess what? You can control four of them in a single battle and switch between them at any time, cutting map traversing down substantially. THANK YOU FOR THAT ADDITION! I think I've made my point clear enough. The wait for Fire Emblem Warriors was a long one, but the payoff was well worth it. And heck, even though the base game and the recent DLC are amazing, there will still be more DLC on the way with the Shadow Dragon and Awakening packs, and any future pack that Cole Tecmo will put in by fan demand. Anything that will get me to seek more hours into this game is fine with me. Also, this is the only game that you can witness Matthew Mercer talking to himself. <laughs> Isn't this fun, Ryoma? Yes, Krom. This is truly enjoyable. I never realized how thrilling it can be to face off against an unfamiliar fighter. He must have been having fun with that. I'm really happy I got a PS4 in 2017. This was a period of time where the console was just booming with games to get for it, and I'm sure that the games that I'll eventually be releasing for it will be great as well. But after I got my PS4 for my birthday, I decided to give this one game called Nier Automata a shot. Prior to this game, I had heard about it every once in a while. From those discussions, I started to get some mild interest in playing the game for myself, so I tried it, and I'm glad I did because HOLY LORDY ZKEEPER EGG ON A KABOM STICK, THIS GAME IS ABSOLUTELY PHENOMENAL! Nier Automata has so much going for it, and everything it does is done spectacularly in every way. The game is a hack and slash tile taking place in a post-apocalyptic world with elements of a bullet hell shooter and an action RPG thrown into the mix. So basically, it's Fallout meets Metal Gear Rising meets Toho with a few Bayonetta elements thrown in here and there, which is an absolutely incredible combination if I do say so myself. That alone won me over, but the game does plenty more to make itself a stunning experience. The world you travel in, despite being post-apocalyptic and overrun with robots, is great in size and gives you plenty to do aside from proceeding with the main story. There's always something beautiful to see and something interesting to do around every turn, so traveling never gets boring, especially when the game's slick controls. And even though the world controls and combat are all amazing in their own way, the game itself actually has a great story on top of those factors, focusing on a resistance created by a civilization of androids called Yorha and a human resistance on Earth from a robot infestation, the inner evolution of personalities of the invading robots and what occurs because of it. When the robots start feeling emotions, the story gets a lot more complex, and when aftermath effects are introduced, the game gets really emotional. As the game goes on, it has a lot of moments that really tug on your heartstrings, and I adore that. That's not all though, there's multiple different characters that you can play as, all packing gameplay styles that make them unique from one another, arcade-like shooting segments, 26 possible endings, and an absolutely magnificent soundtrack. Seriously, Nier Automata's soundtrack is one of my favorite soundtracks in any game ever. It makes the game seem even grander and the more intense more is more exciting. Square Enix and Platinum Games really knocked it out of the park with this one. This is so far my favorite PS4 game and it's pretty easy to see why. Glory to mankind, indeed. If you saw my games of 2016 list, you'd know that one of the games that made that list was Tales of Zillia. And why not? While the game did have some problems, the parts that were well done redeemed it in my eyes. I think at some point Namco Bandai said, We can do more. And they certainly did. Oh yes! Tales Zillia 2 is what happens when you take a well-made RPG and continue a story in a really intriguing way, make the established characters even more likable than they were previously, and refine the gameplay to great extents. 
The story is an improvement above the first one in terms of scale, focusing on the outbreak of fractured dimensions, which behave like parasites leaking away at the real world, and all the events that occur because of it. The plot starts fairly simple, but leaves a lot of things ambiguous to answer them later on. Throughout the story, I was really into where it was leading to, even if some of the details seemed pretty obvious. Even though the Ryan and Zillia 1 was already fantastic with all of its intriguing, funny, and cute moments, Zillia 2 cranks it up a notch. I don't know how the developers were able to make most of these characters more likable than they were in the previous game, but they managed to make at least more of a Precious Simmon role than she already was. They made Gaia's change from a cool character to one of my favorite characters in the series, and Yuzei was actually endearing and hilarious this time around! That's how great the writing in this game is! Well, on that, I can't bring up the writing without mentioning the involvement of the new protagonist, Luger. Now, Luger himself does have a defined character, but they play him more as a silent protagonist that can interact with others based on the dialogue choices you choose for him to say. This sounds weird, but with the way it's implemented, it actually works. The dialogue choices ask you what you would do if you put in the situation he is in, and while most of them only lead to earning possible affinity points for a character, they feel like natural choices that I'm sure the player will most likely share with Luger. Also, Luger's not a blank slate. He actually has a wide array of emotions that I'm sure you'll probably have with him depending on the situation. As for how the game is set up, it's more nonlinear than before. While the areas returning from Zillia 1 are largely unchanged, the structure of the game makes exploring most of them almost completely optional, as you pay a debt of money to a bank to progress through the plot for reasons explained very early on. But how you receive that money is irrelevant. As long as you meet the requirement, you're fine. So what do you want to do? Do you want to go after the elite monsters to get boatloads of cash and experience? Do you want to help other people in their problems and learn more about the world around you? Or do you want to complete the various character episodes to learn more about the game's characters and unlock more content? The game leaves a lot up to you, and I love it for that. Besides, it's hard to go wrong with this game's combat system. It has everything Zillion 1 had, and more. There are way more ways to trigger Link Darts, Link Dart Chains and Overlimit are easier to pull off, Mystic Arts can be pulled off after a Link Dart, eliminating the need to nail an Arcane Art before that, characters can carry more normal arts on them, and in Luger's case, he can use three different weapons plus his Chromatis, which is basically like a super form, leading to various different combos and various different enemy weaknesses. And thank god, the boss has gotten upgrade quality. There are a few that bug me, but most of them are far more enjoyable than the bosses from Zillion 1. Not to mention challenging for all the right reasons. While Zilly 1's bosses were mostly just annoying matches of attack, pick a god, and pray they don't pull off a bullcrap ex machina, Zilly 2's bosses give you a lot more options and ways that you can approach them, but still challenge you to see what you know about the game, and that makes me so happy to say. There's plenty more I could talk about, like the astonishing soundtrack of returning pieces and new pieces alike, a lot of hilarious skits, and the fact that you can dash now, but I think this segment has gone on long enough. While I do think that you need to play Zillia 1 to get the most out of this game, Zillia 2 in the end is a fantastic action RPG that I think anyone who loves RPGs should play. This is definitely my favorite Tales game so far. Oh, we're talking about this game now. Well, in that case... Yeah, number three is Super Mario Odyssey. With all the praise Super Mario Odyssey has gotten since its launch, it's an easy game to pick for a list like this, but that's fine because every last inch of praise this game gets is very much deserved. Unlike some previous Mario games which focused more on linear levels with their own spectacles, Odyssey goes back to territory of open world sandbox levels similar to that of Super Mario 64 and Sunshine. This formula is done spectacularly in Odyssey because the worlds themselves allow you to go after power moons you want to instead of just getting the plot relevant power moons immediately. This sense of freedom has never been so pronounced in a 3D Mario title before. All the game does is just show you a path to a plot relevant power moon that you don't even need to go after in order to move on, and the rest is up to you, which gives the game an enormous amount of replay value as well. Nintendo really evolved the sandbox style in Odyssey overall, and I really admire the success of this attempt. And while the worlds themselves are pretty big, it shouldn't take you too long to memorize landmarks, making it easier to track power moons and other collectibles like purple coins. And with all those purple coins and all the normal coins you can find, purchasing alternate costumes from Mario becomes a possibility. Anyone can make his outfit into anything desirable, from matching the current environment to making him a Super Saiyan in swim trunks, you just jealous of my Super Saiyan swagger. Or just giving the NES outfit to make him go full on America. With all these outfits, it's fun to see how many combinations you can come up with, even if the feature doesn't influence the gameplay that much. Another thing about the gameplay that I adore is the new possession mechanic. Possible disturbing implications aside, this is an incredible thing to have in Mario's repertoire because it adds a lot to the worlds and what you can do in them, and it feels amazing to control enemies like Bullet Bills and Hammer Brothers. The sections that require to use this mechanic are built with the enemy's capabilities in mind, leading to some unique and fun level design. Even though the traditional power-ups are not in this game, I will gladly take this mechanic over them. It's that much fun to use. On top of that, the worlds themselves have interesting themes, the controls are nearly perfect, the boss fights are fun for the most part, the game graphically looks beautiful for the Switch, the soundtrack is pure ear candy, a lot of the extra challenges are fun, and this game offers loads of hours of content that will keep you busy for a long time. Even after you beat the main game, there will still always be more power moons worth collecting to keep you coming back for more. 
I definitely want to play Odyssey more, and I'm sure you'll want to play it at some point if you haven't already. If you have a Nintendo Switch, you are required to get this game for it. You be Mario games, or otherwise. Okay, now I'm done talking about this game for now. Let me take this head off and see what could possibly top that. So this is where the hype train for this game has led us. The wait for The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was a crazy ride. There were quite a few delays and some Zelda games released within the game's development to keep Zelda fans occupied, and soon enough, it was transformed into a launch title for the Nintendo Switch and a swan song for the Wii U. So, how'd it turn out? Did Nintendo keep their promises? Well, considering it's gotten near-perfect review scores everywhere and was voted Game of the Year of 2017, I think the answer is an obvious, yes, they did. Breath of the Wild is a juggernaut of a game to talk about, because the world it creates is absolutely massive and lets you decide how you want to go about it, which appeals to those who just want to see story elements unfold and those who want to get lost in the world, which is filled with things to distract you. I'm not joking that when I say out of the 45 hours it took me to beat the game, around 28 of those hours was just me screwing around with what I could do, or getting distracted by a discovery of a shrine, a weapon that could potentially be better than what I had, bananas, and even a bear that I could hunt or ride on. By the way, Mr. Stable Guy, a bear is a horse. Now let me ride on it any time I please. There's so much to discover in Breath of the Wild that it'll take you a long time to complete it if you're feeling gutsy and explorative. Or, you know, you could just go after the Divine Beasts, which are structured similarly to how dungeons in previous Zelda games worked. And while that option is great in its own way, nothing beats just roaming around and finding whatever you can and embrace the amount of effort placed into this world. With a game like this, your adventure is as long as you want it to be. Nothing is telling you have to beat the Divine Beasts or explore everything in the land of Hyrule. A player could just take on the final boss with the beginner suite of tools, even though doing that is ridiculously hard. The world itself is all yours, and you decide with what you should do with it. And that's why I, among many others, adore the game so much. I love finding what I can and seeing what I can make of it. With all that said, it's easy to see why Breath of the Wild won Game of the Year last year. It is simply a marvelous adventure. Also, one of the DLC packs has a motorcycle. Deja vu. I had to do that. Okay, now before we get to number one, here's some games that I played in 2017 that I also really liked. Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Devil May Cry 3 Dante's Awakening, Ratchet and Clank 2016, Ori in the Blind Forest, Bayonetta, Sonic Forces, Fire Emblem Echo Shadows of Valentia, and Mario and Luigi Dream Team. Do you know anything about me? It's most likely no surprise that Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon showed up at this spot, but believe me, these games do play to make themselves like the original Sun and Moon, which are pretty incredible games in their own way, and add more to them to make the experience in a little lot even better than before. The trail setup does make a return here, but a lot of them are arranged differently despite having a similar theme, and some are completely different than the originals. The newest changes to Alola's trap preparation do a great job at being distinct from the original Sun and Moon, and give everyone something new to experience. While the islands themselves are mostly the same as before, they have plenty of new secrets, locations, and even Pokémon to discover, expanding the possibilities for an in-game team and inventory items even greater than before. Yet despite this, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon managed to be a decent challenge in terms of difficulty. While they're definitely not the hardest games ever, there will be plenty of times where your skills with Pokémon will be tested, especially near the end of the game. Not only that, but the story also received an entire makeover. This is a plot that isn't concerned with the Ultra Beasts as much, although they still do play a big part here. It instead focuses on events that will lead to the legendary Pokémon Necrozma stealing the world's light and what goes down because of that. Even though the original Sun and Moon story was fine as it was, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon give it, and Gen 7 as a whole, an extra push to really challenge what they can do with the concepts already present, making a lot of the new characters more three-dimensional than previously, like the main villain having more complex and human motivation, your rivals getting more screen time and more development than before, and some characters from past gens who only got cameos before having a bit more to do in the story. Call us anyone? I disagree. If all that wasn't enough, many options arise after the main story is completed, getting more Pokémon that you couldn't capture in the main story, new Z-moves becoming available to be discovered and used, and a secret episode that's one big showdown of fan service. With all these additions, the replay value of this game is through the roof, constantly having you check new places and battling new trainers, including ones with different battle conditions, in the various facilities in the game, preventing any sort of boredom. 
There's always more Pokemon to find, more items to find, and more trainers to battle, so you'll be busy for a while trying to find everything. In the end, Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon is at the top of my list because it embodies everything I love about Pokemon, while at the same time doing its own thing to stand out from a lot of other Pokemon titles I adore, even the original Sun and Moon. For what's supposedly the final Pokemon game to be released on the 3DS, I believe the developers went all out with this one. I'm the Lightning Ripper, and we may not know a lot about the new main series Pokemon game that will be releasing for the Switch, but as long as they remember what makes Pokemon incredible, I'm sure that this new installment will not disappoint.